Right, good morning, uh, Minister, and welcome to the Environment, Housing and Infrastructure Scrutiny Panel, panel quarterly hearing with uh, you, the Minister for Environment. I'll start off by uh, touching upon the Government Plan 2023. We note that it's going to be revised in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic and is likely to become a recovery plan. The impact on Jersey's public finances will require consideration of how available public resources should be best prioritised, uh, allocated and used, in fact. How are you reprioritising the viability and deliverability of projects within your department, please? Well, of course, um, the environment and the regulation team, which I take responsibility for, uh, spend around four million uh, a year in revenue and they do have a limited number of uh, projects. Um, but they are part, of course, of the growth, housing and environment department, which has got a budget of used to have a budget around 85 million, but that now is reduced to 65 million. Um, due to the move out of the um, economic development team from that um, from that section, and um, and of course what uh, we have begun to discuss, um, uh, I wrote to you recently, setting out that we'd been asked to look at, uh, or in fact, uh, all ministers have been asked to look at uh, how we could um, cope with a 20% reduction in that budgeted amount, and that is something which uh, Mr. Skate, as the chief officer um, has uh, set in train. Uh, I've made it plain that I expect to have ministerial involvement in those decisions and I'm particularly concerned about the impact potentially on the very limited budgets we have in the environment and regulation team. Regula regulation being virtually self-financing already and, and, the, uh, and the environment team spending very little and seriously stretched and constrained. Uh, and I would take some persuading to go along with budget reductions there. I think what opportunities lie in terms of the, uh, my perspective on GHE, it is the body that is responsible for looking after the island, the physical island on which everything else in Jersey depends. And I think we do need to make sure that we don't lose important investment, in fact, have more investment to coming out of the crisis. And also, uh, I think there are areas where we could eliminate some costs and look at recoveries and fees and charges. And I particularly cite there the potential impact of commercial waste processing. But that is not within my ministry. Uh, that I'm relying on my colleagues, but in turn, that's the direction of travel. So, so, so I, that's now we haven't got Andrew Skate here. So, I want Willie, Willie Peggy has been deputed to step in. Do you want to hear from him, Chairman? But before, before we do, can I just ask where this proposed 20% reduction direction, if I can call it that, is coming from? Is it coming from the um, from the Treasury or the Chief Minister's Department? Right. Well, in my pers I can give you my perspective, and William, Mr. Peggy will give you uh, more information in a moment. Um, I decided that I would disclose to you the request that had come from the um, um, from the Director General as a result of corporate meetings or within our civil service, where every they have been asked to look at examine the possibility of a 20% reduction. And so what I've said to you is my reaction to that. And I put that in a letter which I made public because I do have concerns about that. I wonder if you might invite Mr. Peggy who can give you a more authoritative answer on the source of that. Indeed, Willie, please speak. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good morning. <laughs> nice to see you. My apologies for my lateness. Um, yeah, the minister's right. Um, this, is, this has been a top down um, introduction, 20% um, across the board, which for our budget means £9 million um, across the piece. Um, I think he is also correct though. We, we, whilst there is the, the wish to try to uh, find that from an existing budgets by, by reviewing projects, reviewing large scale infrastructure issues, um, reviewing what we're doing on a regular basis, there's also um, the, the thought process that we need to consider revenue raising potential. Um, and I think that's uh, the direction of travel next. We, we have basic ideas as to how that move might move forward. I think the minister's hit the nail on the head, certainly with one of them, which does not necessarily fit within our uh, political uh, mandate, but certainly fits within the spirit of what we're looking to achieve, which is user pays um, across the board. Um, and that, that's waste. Uh, uh, with payments for uh, pollution, essentially, so polluter pays principle. Um, that's the direction of travel at the minute. Do you see planning fees and such like being increased? 
think Could I? Be... Oh, sorry, Minister. Um, not from my point of view. Um, this we haven't got into that level of detail, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think my concern about that at the moment is that if I get complaints about the planning fees, that they're already too high. And of course, I will have a, if that department now is virtually self-financing. So I think given the fact there's two things that's happened. Firstly, that we are carrying a high level of vacancies and therefore costs are down. And um, and so what I think you would potentially do if you if you did that, you'd be putting the planning service into profit. I don't believe that would be appropriate. It may be possible under the new um, planning, sorry, the new public finances law, but I would not support that. Thank you. I'm going to uh, uh, invite any other members of the panel on any questions on the government plan. Nothing from there, in which case I'll move on to the second. Sorry, Mike, I just did, did want to ask. Um, yes. uh, Kevin said that um, they'd increase charges on waste. That doesn't really come into the uh, environment department's budget, does it? Or is it cross, crossed over? No, so perhaps I should come in there, Chairman. Sorry, I did try and in, uh, explain that. As you know, we don't have an environment or regulatory department. They sit within this um, GHE budget, which is a much larger block of money. And it's at that level where the Director General has to manage. He has to manage effectively these budget decisions across three different ministers, myself, the infrastructure minister and the housing minister. And that's obviously a difficult task. What I just shared with you is my perspective on the parts of that budget that sits within environment uh, and regulation. But obviously I can't ignore the bigger context of what opportunities there are for the GHE um, budget as a whole in terms of major strategy. And uh, that's where the Director General has focused his attention at the moment. Thank you. Oh, we've gone quiet now. Who are we? Um, who's Mike, you might be on mute, are you? I think you've got another question, Chairman. I, I, we, I can't hear you on the line at the moment. Once the Chairman will come in, it's Deputy Gardiner. I'm um, wondering how the negotiations about the 20% cut will go between three ministers within the same uh, department. Are you sitting together and you have uh, joint thinking or is Director General that communicating which, which, with each one of you? That is a very good question, um, Deputy. Um, I think um, the, the, the honest position is that last year's government plan, that process wasn't good because we had four different ministers to deal with, including the economic development minister. And I, I, I think it was very, very difficult. Um, this year, I think we've got a better chance. We've got a different director general and he has pledged to do exactly what you've suggested, try and bring us together. But I think we are at the working up detail stage. Um, what I don't know yet is the deadlines that we're being set by the chief executive because this process is being driven by the Chief Executive's Office and obviously all the work we're talking about would have to fit their timetable. My concern is, is that time is very, very short. And that is why the discussions that are going on about the time of the lodging period for the new fund are very important. The more that process is squeezed, the more difficult it's going to do what we've suggested, Deputy, which is find proper processes to resolve those issues between us. Thank you. Mike, to you. Thank you. Um, with regard to the uh, carbon neutral strategy and sustainable transport, um, although it's the sustainable transport isn't in your remit, they are linked. Uh, what are your views on how they've been impacted by COVID-19? Well, I have difficulty here, as you say, because I'm not au fait with the detail on the sustainable transport plan as I am on the carbon neutral work. And there, the, what I have been overwhelmingly faced with since COVID is that the resources, the um, executive civil service resources that have been available for this work have effectively been um, very largely, if not wholly, 
diverted away from those projects into really essential um, COVID work, both de um, de working on policy, uh, on uh, very big areas of public health policy in the pandemic. And that is a situation which is pertaining. And of course, I did give an answer for carbon neutrality, um, which, which already is on the record in the States, where we would effectively, I believe, have to postpone that uh, substantive work until the autumn. Um, and time, uh, understand on sustainable transport work, I think you are going to have to put the detail to the infrastructure minister, because there are there are civil servants, I think, working on this. And, and I think it's because there is no question that some of the um, some of the um, sustainable transport work, there's money there, uh, needs to be done in the time scale of the um, the transition between COVID and business as normal, consolidated to transport changes. So I, I do apologise, Chairman, I'm not in favour of detail. I've been given a list of uh, areas that are being looked at, but I can't tell you where the progress is or the time scale. I'm sure that uh, will evolve as time goes on and when you start getting your your um, staff back in the department. Have you any? Have you had any indication when you might get your people back uh, onto their, can I call it, proper jobs? No, I'm afraid not. And uh, I think, for example, I can say now that Dr. Louise Magri, who is the leading, uh, the leading professional, and then if, if Louise is online at the moment, she might speak for herself on this. Can I just pause and see if she is? Hello, uh, Minister and Chairman. I, I'm on the line. I can I can help if you would like. Yes, that would be helpful, Louise. Thank you. Um, so, so elaborating on what the Minister has said, that's absolutely correct. The core policy team are currently involved in COVID um, responses, as you've heard. Uh, we are very much aware that the work stream of Brown, both carbon neutral and sustainable transport are equally important, well, you know, uh, not as important, if not as urgent as, as the COVID response. So we are currently at the, at the moment still involved in the COVID response, but officers are now beginning to be able to move back um, to their substantive roles. And the sustainable transport plan in particular that the, the chair notice, uh, notes, um, is now being picked up um, in, in policy terms. Uh, GHE are doing an amount of work in uh, taking some opportunities around sustainable transport that have happened as a result of behaviour change during the pandemic. So an upsurge in cycling and walking, and we're trying to capture those positive behaviour changes with the operational department in GHE. But the policy development work that was outlined in the sustainable transport plan, we're just getting officers back to start that rapid analysis work as well. So whilst there has been a pause, I would like to reassure the panel that we are now beginning to revert back to picking that back up where we can, not just operationally, but also the policy work as well. Thank you, uh, Louise. And actually, I might lead into uh, question three, uh, in which you said in a response to a written question in the States on the 12th of May that funds for the Climate Emergency Fund of 2 million for 2020 might decrease due to a decrease in income from fuel duty. Um, can you expand on that further? It seems fairly obvious that that will be the situation. Well, I mean, this, this is an issue which I had to take advice. My initial thoughts were that the two million pound sums were enshrined in the state's decision in the in the budget plan and therefore would require a state's decision to change that. But of course, I do recognise the practicalities that the uh, change in people's behaviour will have affected the revenue coming from full duty. So I have been corrected and perhaps I can ask Louise to outline that correction because uh, I've, been, I've had to accept that, that that situation that I've outlined is not the case and, it, and the budget is variable. Uh Happy to help, Minister. Yes. Um, sadly, it, it, the, there will be a downturn in income from fuel duty because of changed travel behaviours. And of course, that, that we are advised that will be reflected in money going into the fund. So we expect that the, the first year's five million that was, of course, the seed funding will not be credited with an additional two million this year to bring us to seven by the end of the year. It will be slightly less depending on what the fuel duty um, actuals look like. Um, what, what you will have seen in the answer 159 is 
that uh, there was uh, there's been an agreement by Council of Ministers that uh, that funding that's not spent in 2020 as a result of projects that have had to go on hold because of the pandemic issues and challenges uh, will just be rolled forward into into next year's budget. So so I guess one could one could look at STP and the climate emergency work as being a little bit on ice where logistics and resources prevent us from making progress, but will be picked up as soon as possible with the funding in place, albeit the two million will be less. Likewise, I, I would imagine the reduction in parking charges charges will have an effect because um, given that there aren't any parking charges at the moment, the uh, that department will be suffering significantly from reduced income. Uh, we, we did, of course, increase the parking charges to uh, uh, put into the um, Carbon neutral strategy fund. Uh, sorry, if, if I could correct you there, um, it, it's not my understanding that car parking charges come into the climate emergency fund. That's general revenue that goes into the department as a whole. But your your principle is absolutely correct. There is a loss of income in there due to the suspension of parking charges throughout the response to the pandemic. Um, so that that does prevent. Uh, so going back to the first question around the government plan and meeting, uh, uh, you know, more austere measures to cope with with a reduction in income, that that is a problem for the department because there are there is less of an income coming in as a result of parking charges being delayed and, and put on pause. Thank you. Just to uh, uh, take that a little bit deeper, Louise, the. Uh, it was suggested in the written answer the minister gave on the 12th of May that, that the strategic context of the carbon neutral uh, agenda will change as a result of COVID and we'll need to respond to this changed set of priorities which will recognise the importance of the climate emergency. Um, can you expand on that in any way? Uh, minister, would you like me to go ahead or would you like to? Yes, I, I think that when I made that answer, 12th of May, we were in a very, very bad period of uncertainty. Uh, and the key question I was troubled about is not that I thought that people's uh, passion and determination on the climate change issue would change, but nonetheless, the details of how we do it and the economic situation. I did, you know, I, I think it is possible that some of the areas of environmental pressure that contribute to carbon neutrality um, are going to change in the new normal. And I think it's, it's taken a view of what the new normal uh, might be. My personal aspiration, obviously it has to be as Environment Minister, is that we can consolidate uh, the changes that have happened in behaviours and that we can uh, prevent us bouncing back to the days of, uh, if you like, free and indiscriminate use of, uh, of private cars at very low cost which has, I think, been really damaging to both our carbon emissions and pollution in the island and, and the quality of life and in urban areas and many things I want. To, so I'm hoping that will not change. Um, um, but I think so. I think I think at that stage I'll pause and that's the challenge. And it's probably that the uncertainty is probably the reason why it's still a tab too early to uh, convene and try and agree uh, how that normal new normal will look like. We need a little bit more time, I think. Likewise, um, you've indicated that it's not possible to run the originally envisaged citizens assembly during the crisis. Uh, and, and this is fundamental to the development of the long term climate action. So have you got a, an alternative plan at this stage or is it once again too early? To well, I. I've, um, in my head, I kind of made an assumption that I thought we would, things would get back relatively to normal um, uh, in the summer and that therefore we could restart in September. Uh, I don't know whether that's the case, but um, what we've been able to do, and uh, Louise, I'll invite Louise, Louise to give us a bit more detail in a moment. Louise has been working with the external team uh, that we appointed to do this work. And, and reshaping the project and I've invited uh, Louise to discuss how we, whether there's opportunities to do things through virtual processes. I wonder if I could bring Louise in at that point please. Please do. Thank, thank you Minister. Um, I think that's exactly right. So so just to step back there is absolutely no no diminishment in the importance that the department are giving the 
participatory democratic a democracy process to build the long-term climate action plan so it really is just a case of refocusing some of the strategic questions and, and perhaps people will will feel um, having faced one global emergency in terms of the pandemic it, it may help people to focus on on what these situations can look like and in fact give them renewed uh, focus on the climate emergency concern um, so we hope to be able to frame that strategically very well um, when, when we go forward. But, but the convening question will, will remain quite similar, we think, for the Citizens' Assembly in whatever logistical format it takes. This is still about being carbon neutral. I think it's more about the, uh, the way we might do that through the economic recovery process and how we can have a, a green rebuild to some degree. So there's, there's lots of opportunity there, even though we, we're coming at this from a, from a, a very serious place with the pandemic. Um, I think that the chair asked about the logistics, um, and that, that's a really good question. So, so as you know, initially we hoped to have a citizens' assembly that would involve an awful lot of face-to-face uh, -face, uh, 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 workshops. It would be convened as a jury. There would be so, you know a number of weekends where people would spend the whole day together. Uh, they would be facilitated. They would work in workshop formats. You know, all, all of that sort of thing that you, you recall when we, we launched this as a proposal. Um, I think now, obviously, we are moving into a new normal around, around physical distancing and gatherings and the ability to, to create discussion forums of that type. And we are discussing with our advisors how they, they might be able to accommodate our wish for an open and, and transparent process where it might not be possible, for example, for facilitators to easily fly into the island. Um, it might not be possible easily for a large gathering of, you know, we, we talked about 100 people initially, and, and that clearly wouldn't fit with what we know about virus transmission at the moment. So one option for us is to look at an online process. Um, and you may be aware that the UK Climate uh, Emergency Citizens Assembly uh, began in real time, um, and then it actually finished in, um, in a virtual format. And we're drawing, our advisors have been involved in that, and they're drawing on their experience and learning from, from that switch to sort of understand how productive and realistic a, a virtual approach is. And we've all learned during the pandemic that there are opportunities to do things digitally as, as we are today. We have a slight concern, I think, that we need to square off and discuss with the minister and possibly even the state assembly, which is the, the value and depth of the discussions uh, often are more fruitful in a face to face environment and in the margins of meetings. You know, when people break for coffee, they they that stimulates discussion. Um, and, and we feel perhaps that the participants of the citizens assembly process may um, you know, it might not be as fruitful a process as we would like if it, if it was done digitally. Um, think, how, sorry, sorry, Chair, please go ahead. I think, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, the, I think we would all agree that a face-to-face -face, uh, meetings are far more productive and um, there would seem little point in doing a citizens' assembly just for the sake of it to tick the box without it being 100% uh, effective. Um, I'm going to move us on, um, Minister, if I may, to the planning and regulation uh, side of uh, your department and ask that um, in light of the Comptroller and uh, Auditor General's recent report on the use of enforcement powers, the GHE department was criticised for having informal, unpublicised and differing enforcement policies, especially in planning. What are you doing to address this and other recommendations made in the report? Uh, OK, understood, Chairman. Um, I think we do have online, uh, I hope, Peter Legrelli. I don't know if Peter Legrelli is online, is he? If he's not, I think it may, well, Mr. Peggy may have to cover for him. Um, but anyway, I'll make an introduction. Um, I'll be frank, I was really quite taken aback with the Control and Auditor General's uh, report when I received it. Um, it was a legacy report that I understand had been done many, many months ago and uh, public in, uh, publication in the middle of a pandemic did surprise me. Um, we, um, what I was really disappointed about in that report, it made a whole series of very damaging complaints without recognising the context of planning enforcement work, 
that how difficult it is in any small community and certainly in a small island where everybody knows everybody else, how you can achieve effective enforcement um, uh, in, in planning transgressions. And we have a, a quite a big history of this. Um, and of course, we have complaint boards where on the one hand, we, the, the officers are have been criticised for being too um, severe and too uh, draconian, if you like. Um, and uh, therefore, the practice has switched and now uh, the officers are now being uh, criticised for being too soft. Uh, and I'm afraid pretty well every case that, that reaches me, I am seeing that dilemma. And now the problem we have is one now of um, serious resourcing. Um, once upon a time, there were that team was a, a stronger in number. Um, now I, it is only effectively talking to um, Mr. Le Grayley, who heads that team. Um, it, well, it doesn't head that team only, it comes under his responsibility because he's also responsible for development control. He has one and a half people. Um, as a result of which they've appointed a short term contract person who has managed to reduce that caseload down, I think, very substantially from around 400 to around about 250. Um, but nonetheless, these are very, very difficult and challenging cases. And with, this is an area where we do very, very significantly need to have much greater resource on that task. And that is something I've made very, very clear. I've asked the DG to get that under train. And so my concern is that none of these things I've explained um, how was, in my view, adequately covered in the uh, Control on Air Auditor General's report that I have to say I view very much as a piece of a tick boxing exercise of management speak, where frankly, there's a real issue here about how we can break that enforcement. But in the end, there's a big policy choice. If we can really upgrade and staff it with, and take a very strong line, but would that be what the community wants? We've tried to run the enforcement team with the cooperation and help of people and do it by uh, a voluntary way. And I think there's a big parallel with the way that our law enforcers have had to deal with, had to deal with issues in the pandemic. The better way is to work with the community. So I think probably I've said enough and maybe if I can ask Mr. Peggy to deal with the staffing issues, I'm sure the panel will have questions about the policy issue. Thank you. Yes, Peggy, with you, Peggy. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Minister. Um, yeah, just picking up on that that issue, I, I uh, had a conversation with Andy uh, this morning and he sent me a, a response, a summary of a response, but picking up on that particular issue, um, He's advising that the new target operating model for, for regulation does bolster resources in, in the compliance function and will aims to bring together all land related activities. So that will include not just planning, building control, but also land law um, as well. Um, agricultural land law, that's the intention to agglomerate those, those matters. Um, the regulation directorate's also got a, a new regulatory improvement function as, as part of the structure, and this will focus on outputs of, of the review, uh, plus the recently conducted Planning Officers Society review to, to improve the service area. Would you, uh, can, am I right in thinking now that um, uh, in the light of potential conflict from uh, the uh, Director General or within his uh, remit that that regulatory side has been passed down to, to you? Is that the case now? Um, as an interim measure, um, I've been in discussions about uh, with that with Andy Skate. Yes, that's the idea. The idea for the moment, but there's work to be done there to determine exactly how that's going to work. Um, I think uh, the improvement of of uh, suitably uh, robust walls there to ensure that there is no conflict of interest um, need to be put in place, and we need to. Uh, and we've got that in place um, at a slightly less formal level, but with the agreement of previous Attorney Generals. I think we need to bolster that. Um, and try and make it a little bit more formal um, to make sure that we've got full understanding from all parties, be they regulatory or from an applicant's perspective even, um, where these, where, where the areas of responsibility lie to make sure that people properly understand that there is no conflict of interest in that respect, yes. It's largely perceptional, I don't think there's a, any doubt about that and I'm sure the, the 
these controls in the department are perfectly satisfactory, but it, it doesn't tend to reflect well on the officers if there is a perceived conflict. Um, I, I, I think you raise, sorry, uh, Chairman, I think you raise a good point. I think there, there are those um, out there, for want of a better phrase, who would perceive um, that, that there is a, a definite conflict of interest, I think, uh, with the professional protocols that are put in place between officers in the department and indeed um, with our law officer colleagues. Um, it, it's possible to work through it. I think the, the, the issue is in the clarification and making sure that uh, essentially that's publicised to the extent that it should be. Indeed. Now, some of your builder control officers were deployed during the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. Are they back within the department now? No, let me, I think before Mr Peggy comes in, I'd like to stress that there is no question that the team which is uh, led by Mr Peter Legrelli, um, who heads both the development control team and at the moment, um, prior to the changes Mr Peggy's described, um, the enforcement of function sits within him, have had a serious uh, reduction in their staff numbers. Um, I think, uh, I think the, my understanding is pretty well over half of that unit has been at one time or other diverted on to doing really essential uh, tr uh, co uh, contact tracing work. Uh, along with, as I understand it, the training standards team and uh, if not all of the environmental health team. And I have to tell you, uh, Chairman, I've been enormously impressed with that. And I think it's really important um, that that was done and I believe continues to be done because I don't want to see why we're in still, you know, it's still too early to be relaxed, to ease off on our contact tracing. Um, we need that has, that has done that serve the island fantastically and unlike other jurisdictions who have failed in that area we've done well and we need to stick at it and I was very but there's no question the result has been is that the numbers of staff available for business as usual work has significantly uh, reduced and as a result the throughput I Mr. the Grady it's unfortunately I would like him to be here it's my fault probably that I didn't alert him but the planning function is probably running at less than 50 percent at the moment on applications the planning committee is meeting uh, less frequently and doing online and at the moment that the the nature of the applications they've dealt with have been very um have been what you might call the more minor and uncontroversial matters and that the big the big decisions the controversial ones with lots of objectors have not been built through the virtual system. And I think the, uh, the this discussion going on with the chairman of the planning committee, um, Deputy Russell Labby, as to you know what's before that. Um, I have also, um, I have to say that the planning appeals function is effectively on hold. And that is because it's not possible to get planning inspectors to the island. And therefore there, we are dealing with the, the stuff that's in the pipeline. But other than that, I'm afraid. So the planning system has suffered and with it, the building control function as part that it, what I've said applies equally to them. Of course, um, a lot of construction sites stop work effectively. So if you like, for a period that helped us, but as the construction sites open out, um, that is potentially more of a problem. And of course, we've given the uh, we've given the um, the building control officers the job of actually uh, including in their visits, uh, site visits, um, comments and checking on the social distancing in accordance with the construction permits that are out there. So I'm afraid this is an area that has um, uh, has been affected. At the moment, I can't give you an update, and maybe will, Mr. Peggy will. I know there's a programme of recruitment, and this is probably a time I need to bring in Mr. Peggy with his recruitment programme and the way they're trying to get out of the situation I described. But I want to be clear, I think that was the right thing to do. Absolutely the right thing to do. Thank you, Minister. Just before, um, Willie, you come in, uh, uh, Connetab Le Lemaitre has a, some... A yeah, I was just asking the Minister, really, is, I, I think he's saying that the, because of the pandemic, the planning control officers have been stretched, to say the, to say the least. Um, when, will it, when will things get back to normal? Well, I think this is linked to where Mr. Peggy, I, I wish I could say, and I think this is where I need to know as well, because I am under pressure. Uh, I'm getting now a lot of concerns being expressed to me about the importance uh, for economic recovery. Um, but I'm quite clear, I don't 
share the view that I've heard espoused that we should relax regulation and that we should try and build our way out of, a, out of, if you like, the economic problem. But I think if I can invite, please, Mr. Peggy to come in here. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, indeed, Minister. Yeah, I think it's important to note that uh, up uh, at the, the peak of our, uh, our participation, we've had 33 members of staff involved in contact tracing um, across the piece, which is no, no mean feat. Um, at the moment, we're down to 22. And the Minister's right, we're involved now in working um, with getting them back into business as usual. Um, that is not finalised yet. It's being discussed at a corporate um, level at the moment. Um, and in terms of timescales, we're not entirely sure when that's going to be. Um, the, the discussions are ongoing at DG level. Um, and as you would rightly say, Minister, I think, you know, th there's been a bit of a sterling effort there. Um, and the staff in, who have been involved are, are now getting and are pretty tired. Um, so a quick resolution to uh, th this would be very much welcomed uh, to make, because not not only we do we need to spread the um, responsibility back into government, but there's a, an ever increasing um, level of business as usual that's coming back into play with the opening up of, of the various stages of COVID response. Um, so we would very much welcome a quick uh, resolution to this. Yes, I, I think it should be recognised, Chairman, that people have been working, I believe, weekends and evenings. So this is not a question of sort of nine to five. So I'm sorry to interrupt there, Chairman. Yes, I I, I, uh, uh, I support exactly what you say. And um, I, I really um, have great admiration for those who are putting in enormous uh, hours to, uh, to support us in this. Are you conscious that there may be some building works that are continuing outside planning consent? Um, and given the uh, lack of monitoring levels, uh, are you aware of any of this going on at the moment? Well, it's interesting. I think certainly when the lockdown came, uh, I was in receipt personally of a very large number of phone calls of people expressing concern about adjacent building sites still operating, not social distancing and so on. I think and I think initially then we brought in then the um, we brought in the permitting system um, where at the moment I've heard nothing negative about that. Um, what I was very interested in the recent figures uh, that were presented to uh, presented to states members about the um, proportion of construction industry workers that are back at work. I think probably that's the the best indicator to go on. But the level of complaint the, uh, reaching me about construction work on sites has now kind of faded away, or, you know, almost to normal. What I am getting complaints there is where you've got um, uh, enforcement breaches. I'm getting a lot of complaints about where there are no, where there are alleged planning, I say alleged, alleged planning uh, uh, tra um, transgressions and uh, also um, work in antisocial hours uh, and antisocial working practices of noise, extreme noise, late into the evening, nine at night and working. I'm getting complaints about those, which of course are public health nuisance issues because we normally have uh, on the construction sites um, hours, of, um, hours of operation, which are not a planning condition, but are a, uh, if you like, a public health nuisance um, arrange, um, direction. Um, that clearly is now being um, not happening. It's now being breached. And it's something I've asked the officers to do. Um, and I've had advice that I do need to um, reform and improve and sharpen up the public health nuisance uh, laws, which I'm proposing to do. But at the moment, there's no, the team is, I'm afraid it's far too stretched to be able to even think about that at the moment. Thank you. I'm sorry, yeah, if you wouldn't mind, if I, if I could perhaps just update you on going back to the inspections on site that we've been undertaking um, through the COVID process. I'm not sure whether you've had any uh, sight of, of what's been going on there in terms of construction site visits, but um, up until uh, the 2nd of June this year, we've had 171 site inspections being carried out by our officers, um, and the majority of which uh, would appear to have been relatively uh, impressively safe. We've got um, 
we've we, we rag status them. Um, and so we've had six reds, 15 ambers, and 150 green status, which shows that the construction industry are very much paying attention to the requirements for COVID um, uh, or, or special COVID requirements on site. That's um, pleasing uh, to hear that. Um, Chair, Chair uh, may I ask the question? Sorry, it's Deputy yes, Deputy, Morris. carry on. Thank you. Um, no, it's just to go back to the Minister, um, and I may have misunderstood, but Minister, are you saying that it's because of resources, you know, um, your, your, the department isn't really able to undertake public health um, inquiries when they are made to, to the department? So, you know, not public, uh, environmental health inquiries. So. Well, I think I have had, I think this is where I haven't had a full report, so I'm not able to give you a balanced view. But what I can do is give you an answer by giving you impression of the complaints that reach me, because my experience that, that when there are problems, I tend to hear about them through emails. And, and at the moment, it is, it's true to say that our public health expert team uh, ha have had substantially um, diverted away, um, away because of the public health emergency and COVID work. And, and therefore the work, for example, on housing regulation, uh, which they would normally do housing complaints, I believe has um, been affected. Um, but nonetheless, what we've had to do is where we get priority cases um, and where I get those complaints, um, I ask the officers to deal. Now, I don't know, have we got Carolyn Mafia on the on the call here? She, she is um, deputising for, um, for Alison de Borsier, who leads that team, who is working, you know, flat out. She's heading contact tracing, so she's not available. Um, I don't think we've got an environmental health person on, have we? Or no, I, I think not, Minister, but I, but I'm just conscious that we've got a bare minimum of two two members of their staff currently working on what would traditionally be considered environmental health matters because everybody else has been seconded onto contact tracing through COVID. Um, uh, uh, the intention being Hopefully, as I say, that we've got um, Andy Skate level discussions going on about trying to get everybody back into the swing of things, as it were, by end of June, mid July. But as I say, that that timescale is yet to be confirmed. And could I add that there is a big issue here? I think one of the lessons we've learned in um, in COVID is the desperate importance of um, the link between environment and health. And uh, and we have, I, in my view, we have underinvested. We have not given sufficient weight to the uh, the teams of people, that are the expertise that we need to build up that capability and resource, so that we are better placed in the future to deal with uh, problems which affect the health of our community. And I've asked Mr. State, and I've asked Dr. Turnbull, our medical officer health to uh, and uh, and the chief executive to to um, I think I've asked the chief exec anyway um, to, to, to convene meetings so we can see how we prepare how we organize ourselves so beyond the beyond the pandemic we are better placed and better resourced to to deal with this I'm sure there'll be much to do Deputy Gardner you have a question Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I would like to just follow up as we do have a question about environmental health, but I would think let's deal with it now. Minister, recently we had, I had personally a couple of complaints about smoke, dust, noise, which all connected to the environmental health. The telephone somehow hasn't been picked up. What would you suggest at the meantime when we realize that the team is redeployed and you have limited resources, how we should address these issues that coming from the parishioners at the meantime. OK, well, I'd, I'd like to deal with the issue of communication. Um, I think there there is communications, I do believe, probably have been disrupted uh, during the pandemic on these sort of matters. What I'm still trying to understand now, I'm getting between four, five, maybe six calls on such routine matters myself at home now, which is unusual. And they're very wide ranging, you know, right across the whole field of all sorts of issues I'm getting. And so I've asked the ministerial support team to have a look at that because I'm I think at the moment that's a symptom on the substantive issue. I think the issue of noise regulation, in my opinion, has long been an area we need to do more. And I think because there is a strong link, I believe, between noise impact on people and their mental health. 
and, uh, and and that is something where I think requires us to upgrade legislation and that's a project on its own. On terms of air pollution of uh, smoke and that does annoy people and I'll be frank it annoys me that we're on beautiful lovely sunny days where no wind people like bonfires and everybody around has to breathe this stuff and for asthmatics and others with breathing difficulties it's a terrible problem um, that we don't have a law on this at the moment there is no equivalent of the sort of clean air act type thing that was done in in london and uh, there are all sorts of issues about wood smoke uh, and so on where we don't have any regulated frameworks that's something that i would like to see done but i'm but i'm apologies uh, deputy gardener i'm afraid i don't have the resource at the moment and of course the, the list of legislation that we're waiting for, because the law officers are working, concentrate on COVID stuff. There's just such a long list that we're talking, you know, I, I just don't know when this stuff will get done. It would be good to follow up the communication part, because as you said, the communication between the residents and the environmental health department was interrupted, but the complaints are still there and the issues are still there. So at least we can tell to the public if you have a problem, this is the way that you can communicate with us directly, because now it feels there is a breakage in the communication. Right. Well, my number is in the everywhere. This is why I get the calls, I suspect, because probably yes. the minister. I don't, I don't mind doing that. Um, <laughs> I do my best when I get them, but of course I have to refer them to officers um, and that's where we run into the resource issue. Thank you. Um, Minister, Thank I'm going to take us on to the uh, island plan. You've previously spoken about trying to get the Council of Ministers to dovetail the island plan timetable with the population or migration policy timetable. Given that the island plan publication may be delayed beyond September 2020, are you still keen for that to happen? Well, we've had to have a very big uh, rethink. Uh, I think, as you know, I had that discussion with the council. Uh, I've had in the run up to COVID, I've, made, I've taken that position publicly all along um, because we're dealing with a 10 year plan. Um, now, I believe now we, we have been asked, I've been asked, as I said in my recent answer in the States, to produce a plan uh, before uh, the next elections and what I am uh, I'm, I'm going to invite the officers to speak in a moment what the officers and I have been working up a detailed plan of how we might do that and that report is due to go to the Council of Ministers tomorrow and I gave a public answer to Deputy Masson last states to the fact that I will be having an interim debate in the states about that very thing um, I, I can tell you that at the moment um, that I think I will disclose it. Um, the proposal that I've taken to COM tomorrow is that we have what we call a bridging island plan and that that is for a three year period and therefore I think that we'll have to make assumptions and therefore and I therefore I think that link potentially is is detached but I'd like at that stage before you follow that up Steve I may ask Steve Skelton or Kevin Pilly to comment. Perhaps I should start with Steve, if I may, please, um, uh, Chairman. Yes, Steve. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Um, I mean, I think, uh, as has been covered a number of times during the uh, conversation so far, the pandemic's had a range of impacts on our work, and that's both in the immediate sense of diverting um, the team onto other matters, but it also creates a degree of uncertainty in the future context. Um, which can create challenges for um, developing long-term policy. And so uh, out of the, uh, the ministerial conversation, um, which has requested a plan before the end of this term of government, we've been uh, working to um, understand in a little bit more detail which elements of the planning regime um, are at a point where can they, the policy can be set with more confidence and which elements are um, subject to greater uncertainty. And that's led to this uh, proposal that the Minister outlines for a, um, a bridging plan which can provide um, progress in those policy areas where we can have confidence and um, a more bespoke interim policy regime in those areas where we might expect the next few years to be different to the longer term um, trajectory for the island. And that's I think, primarily in areas of, of, of economic response to the pandemic. And, and we know that the economy is very closely associated with levels of inward migration in Jersey. So there, 
two areas where it's likely that um, it will be difficult to um, build long term policy on that uh, shorter term evidence base. And uh, as the minister suggests, that's been worked up into a proposal which is due to be considered by ministers. That would seem sensible. Uh, Connor Tabla Major. Uh, yes, um, Steve, I know, was involved in the process of um, assessing um, sites for housing. And obviously, I know he's been involved in other things at the moment. Has that process been going on in the background? Because obviously, we are short of housing at the moment. And um, before 2022, we will need to have some sites rezoned. Um, so does that probably give two answers to that and perhaps let um, Kevin speak to the, the second one. I think the first in general is to say we're very conscious of the uh, the housing um, situation in the island and, and I think one of the um, the reasons that the wider council of ministers are keen to progress the island plan is, is exactly to deal with uh, some of those underlying ch or the challenges that underlie that housing situation um, and that's both in respect of um, market housing um, and particularly some of the conversations we've had with 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 uh, the Connetarbs in different parts of the islands, uh, but also in respect of affordable and key worker housing, which has been an issue for uh, for a while now. So we are certainly thinking about this uh, bridging island plan as something that could expedite work in those areas. Um, in terms of the question around the specific ongoing um, uh, sort of assessment of, of land and sites, I'd have to ask Kevin to pick that up. May I ask a question, please, Sir Chairman? Please, Lady, go ahead. Um, you, we know that there are quite a few sites on hold, sort of thing, for the hospital. If these sites are rejected, could they go for housing instead? Perhaps, perhaps I should just briefly come, because I think obviously we. What is my intention if the Council of Ministers approve this plan tomorrow, is to bring a discussion paper into the states for an in-committee debate as soon as I can, because I think the issue that members are raising are exactly is what we would expect. We've got the issue of the hospital, we've got the issue of housing sites, and we've got uh, urban issues and so on. There's a number of issues which I think the work that we've done, I've done with the officers, clearly indicates um, would, would form part of a bridging plan. Um, but where those details, you know, what's in and what's out. I think we do. I certainly, first of all, I hope that uh, the Council of Ministers uh, tomorrow are able to allow me to go ahead with this. Um, and then the, 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 the current discussion document that's in the States will be removed and a, and a new one highlighting both the changes in the process for the plan and what's in and what's out, if you like. And that will be an in-committee debate. And so rather than kind of preempt that discussion because i'm absolutely clear there needs to be a very broad political debate uh, on those questions with members and of course after that i think the public as well so uh, maybe a pause i'm sorry if i interfere with your question there uh conic tarb uh of st savior couldn't you want me to bring in steve skelton now and answer the detail or kevin uh, no, I no, I, I think I think you've been fair with that. It's just that if these sites were big enough for a hospital, and they're going to be rejected, we could put a whole lot of homes there, and that's just something that that I was thinking of. Yeah, there's there's quite a long list of issues there that just can't be left, and there's no question about that. Those major issues of the, the you know key in my mind will be the decisions about what we do with all of these state-owned sites or big sites around the area. And the moment, my feeling is the whole situation has been almost, uh, I don't know what you call it, log jam, moribund or what? There are no decisions going on. No. And, and I'm very, very clear that I will not support piecemeal decision making, where we make a decision on one site without knowing what the effects on another one and so on. And that's the challenge in the plan that I want to have and I've made it quite plain to the chief executive and the council of ministers that every time I can we need that big property strategy and that because in my view that's an essential component of, 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 the, of the interim bridging island plan that we've spoken of but that's only my view chairman. Okay well thank you very much and good luck tomorrow. Thank May you. I ask a question uh, chair? Uh, just a comment. Chairman, can you, I, I just part of my question was to I just was I wanted to clarify whether the assessment of housing sites was carrying on in the background at the moment or whether that's good. Can I ask Kevin Pilly to please uh, that up, Chairman? 
Indeed. Uh, Kevin. Yeah, yes, thank you, uh, Chairman. Yes, I'm happy to uh, to answer that question. Uh, yes, uh, Constable, the uh, the work on the assessment of um, uh, sites that's come in through the uh, call for sites process is uh, is on, is ongoing. Uh, so we're assessing those uh, those sites as a matter of course, uh, as we would do anyway. So um, uh, that work is being uh, progressed in the background, and uh, that work would be released um, at the same time as that we published a, a draft plan. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Morrell. Uh, thank you. Um, Minister, um, as the Environment Panel, we um, received a presentation where it was quite clear that you, uh, or you and the department favoured an island plan that process which finished after the elections. Um, why have you changed your mind on that? I suppose um, I've listened to advice. I've listened to the views of other people. Key to me is that the previous discussion we had was on a rather different principle. It was about how we can produce a 10 year plan uh, in the current circumstances. And I think that is why, um, and certainly, uh, you know, having, I've asked for the advice from our external advisors um, who are major international practice and they've and that that is uh, that advice has uh, has helped me a lot in in thinking and this i this suggestion that we can have a plan for this uh, this bridging interim period and then that will then give the states the opportunity to then deal with the uh, the long term after then and i think the timing now works because not only have I had the advice of our professional advisors on planning, land use planning, um, but I've also been able to see the reports of the fiscal panel, the financial work that's been done about the economic recovery, which clearly shows that Jersey is going to go through this period of economic recovery, which will last potentially for around the three years. And I think this is the, the, so therefore having a plan for this interim I think it's a good plan. I was convinced of that. Initially, I didn't see that possibility, but I also think now that it's a very good job. It's a very good opportunity for us to, if you like, hopefully clear the decks of those issues that have been hanging around for ages so that the new states in 2022 can legitimately then, when things have settled and the, the post Hopefully the, 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 the COVID pandemic is well behind us and things have settled. They can then set the course for the next decade for the island. And I think that will be on the new normal. And we will see, I expect that we'll see different things, the way offices are used, about the migration requirements for the island, what skills, what industries, what you know, we'll know by then, the shape of tourism and so on, which at the moment we don't. Um, but uh, I, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I thought you'd paused. So, no, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, Deputy. Carry on. Yeah, I just wanted to. Um, obviously, if you do go ahead with any sort of plan, whether it's interim or whether it is a ten-year plan, um, there is going to be restricted time in which to do that. So, um, will you be able to promise the same length of opportunity for public consultation? And, you know, will you not be cutting back on the opportunity for the public to consult? Because regardless of how long the plan is, the buildings that could get built as a result of that are there for our lifetime. So the public will want just as much opportunity to speak. An excellent question, Deputy. And of course, up until now, in all my comments in this uh, hearing on this subject so far, I've concentrated on the substance of the, of the scope of the plan and so on. But there's no question there are equally very, very big questions about the process that we would need to follow to do, a, if you like, a bridge plan in, in, in this timetable. And there will have to be changes, which I think will have impact on the uh, opportunities that there are for public and for the uh, states members to try to, to, to contribute and fully because the key that I wanted to have in my original vision of the island plan having done this in other places was to achieve present the plan that had full a really a very very high degree of public and political engagement now I think the processes have had to be modified at the moment I that I want to hear the views of states members 
on the policy on the document that we were put together and I, in the in committee debate and I, I think probably I should reserve my position as to whether or not I think we can do that or not. I don't know whether Mr Skelton or Mr so Police. If, if I, before we go to Mr Skelton, if I could just say it sounds like this interim plan could be used as a way to force through controversial projects without the public being given appropriate say. How will you ensure that that is not the case? Well, um, the I think this is where politics, if you like, rules. Uh, I think whether my colleague members like this or not, under the law, the only person that can present a plan is the two of the states for approval is the, the person, the member that holds the office of the environment minister. And uh, my judgment is that I would not be party to uh, things being railroaded through. And um, but in the end, I'm only one member. And if you know, I'm, I'm, up, I'm accountable for what I do and present to the assembly. I mean, I'm going to be in the hands of all members of the states on this. Thank you, Minister. I, I look forward to the in-committee debate. Um, you previously, um, we, we, we note that the Willie Miller Urban Design Consultation for St Helier has now been completed. We were expecting a report early in 2020. Are you able to share that with us at this stage? Could I pass it over to my colleagues? I'm not sure if it's Kevin or Steve. Uh, Kevin, please. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to uh, answer that, Chair. Uh, yes, we are in the um, uh, final stages of um, uh, working with uh, Willie Miller to um, to finalise that report and to be able to release that, Chair. So um, uh, that that work's been affected by the uh, the pandemic in terms of its progress, but it is in train and it will be released shortly. As will a number of the um, the original evidence-based reports that were commissioned as part of the original island plan review. Uh, so that. In Includes things like the um, uh, the landscape and seascape um, character appraisal work as well. So um, you know, as those background uh, reports are are completed, they'll be um, be released as part of the um, the new island plan review program. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move now on to away from planning and on to the draft wildlife law. Um, the Draft Wildlife Jersey law proposed uh, has COVID uh, has COVID nineteen actually given you pause for thought on some of the proposals uh, put in this law? For example, protecting a wild animal uh, or its den within within the living area of a dwelling house. Does this mean that homeowners would have to dwell alongside wildlife in their homes? In some cases, with entire areas being reserved for the sole use of a protected species, and we wonder whether you're revising that in the light of the knowledge that bats and other animals are known to be transmitters of disease, COVID-19 included. Okay, I'd like to just introduce before I hand over. I think this is an area where this area is being led by my, my assistant minister, Deputy Gida, and I think it would be appropriate for him to start off with that and then bring in Mr Peggy who's leading that project. Could I do that please, Minister? Indeed, thank you. Morning, Deputy Gida. Good morning. The um, uh, bats haven't been found to carry COVID-19 at this stage. Uh, many other species of animals, mammals, um, the household cat, for example, uh, have been instead. So um, we don't think that there is absolutely you know, any risk that you should worry about um, between bats and uh, humans, you know, transmission. Um, it's also not an animal that we're in physical contact with very often. So compared with rats, mice, almost all species of birds, um, the transmission is very, very, um, so transmission risk is extremely, extremely low. So it's not, it's not, um, it's not an animal that um, you know, is considered in, Europe as a risk of transmission because we don't catch them and we don't eat them. Good. Very well put. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and with regard the uh, di so have you consulted with any environment health environmental health experts in the consultation of this law or do you intend to? Well, who wants to answer this, Gregory or Willie? I, I can answer that if, if you would like me to, Gregory. I'm comfortable. Yes, please go ahead, William. I'll, um, I'll complete if I think there's anything missing. Fine, thank you. Um, no, the, the, there was no specific consultation with environmental health colleagues, but rather there was um, reference to existing research um, that's been undertaken. I'd point us to Malentz and Stricker 2020 
um, which shows that bats are not shown to host any more human disease causing zoonotic viruses than any other groups of animals. I think uh, th there's quite a lot of um, doctrine out there that supports this. Um, and indeed, there's a, a range of advice for homeowners that we've pointed to within our amended legislation, which is specifically around bats, um, that can give some understanding of, uh, of the, the, I was going to say, the risk, but the lack of risk um, around this area. Have you have you considered widening your consultation to include architects, engineers, builders, and homeowners on the implications to homeowners of proceeding with the draft law? Well, uh, William, sorry, I'd, I'd I'd love to come in here. And you will correct me if I'm wrong. I think the uh, there has been a misunderstanding because there is a change in wording between the 2000 law and the new draft. Uh, this change in wording is not a new policy. It's a typo in the original law. Uh, yeah. The only protection that we can give bats is to make sure that they can live in roofs and attics. That's where they live in Jersey. Uh, they also have roost in, uh, in trees in, at certain periods, uh, but they mostly live in uh, roofs and attics. So if we want to protect them at all, that's how we protect them. So we allow for removal of bats that are in the living area of a dwelling. And that's what was meant in the 2000 law. Um, because of a copy and paste error, it just happened to not be there in the actual article. So the, um, uh, the intent, has not changed within 2000. We are protecting bats in their habitat, which is roof and attics. Thank you. I'm going to move to... Uh, Sorry, Chairman, uh, could I just ask a question about indeed, that? Please, please, please go ahead. Um, sorry. Um, why, when, because uh, we, we've had this recent experience on the farm at home, why, if you are doing something, do, do we have to pay for people to sit night after night counting bats coming in and coming out when we know that they are there. And um, and, and, and then the, we, we're made to build homes for them, which they don't want, and they're going to move off or try and get to where they were originally. That is OK, but it's the expense of having somebody sitting night after night counting them. Why does why is that in in, in, in the law, please? I can I can help with that. Um, for the time being, it's the only way we have found Sorry, uh, we need a formal survey conducted by a professional to know exactly what sort of roost we have, how many bats use it, and what sort of um, protection or mitigation we can apply. Um, the current system is not the best that it could be. No. Ideally, you would want the whole community to pay for the protection of bats. And right now, because it's homeowners who are trying to develop their homes, uh, we have to pay the whole cost at random, depending on whether they have a risk of having bats, whether bats have been seen. Uh, it's not very equitable. It would be better if we could have um, a fund for that sort of things and um, do the uh, surveys out of that so that everybody in the island protects all of our wildlife. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Minister, rented dwellings. Um, you're proceeding with the lodging for the debate in September 2020 of P106, the Public Health and Safety Rented Dwellings Licensing Regulations. You told us that existing landlords that fail to license their property within the grandfather rights period will have to pay £100 for their first license and the property will be inspected. You propose the grandfather period of six months. What's your reasoning for that period, please? Well, I wanted to um, give a reasonable period so that um, when the law, if the states do approve the law, the properties uh, at the at the day, if you like, that from the day that the law uh, comes into effect, that all of the existing properties which are rented out would have a trouble free process to allow them to um, register. And um, so are trouble free uh, and therefore because they wouldn't require inspections uh, the if you like the license would automatically be approved um, and that the uh, that they would uh, not and of course part of my proposals is they would not be required to pay a fee uh, for that licensing 
until the expiry of their first two year license. And so we my I discussed this with my assistant ministers and the officer teams and uh, I, I considered that a six months process was a uh, period was probably better um, than the earlier date that was being spoken about about three months uh, because there are a, a, a large number of properties and also uh, I wanted to make sure that the systems that we have in place for doing that registration and licensing are capable of doing this efficiently uh, and uh, what uh, and online so that therefore there should be a seamless uh, transmission and that would then lead to a situation that after the expiry of that uh, grandfather period then any property that was coming into the system new as a rented property would then then have to go through the uh, of application and potentially be subject to inspection uh, and they have to remind you they wouldn't all be inspected but some would they would be subject to inspection and, and therefore i think we thought the flow of work could work for the housing team in a way which was much more kind of stripped down and practical uh, and less complications and that's what is was in my proposal that i wrote to you about and of course everything i've said has yet to be uh, published um, openly in the states uh, because at the moment I have asked for the an amendment to to to, to facilitate that which involves changing the dates um, and but that is still in the in the queue uh, of law drafting uh, I don't know if any of my I don't know if other my, my political colleagues want to comment on that but my understanding is that is supported by the the housing minister as well thank you I, I mean uh, I'm told there is a suggestion that uh, there is a lack of linkage between um, maybe the social services department because we already have the control of housing and work Jersey law 2012 whereby it's mandatory to notify a change of address so that minister if that legislation comes under her will encompass uh, the names and addresses of people within the island is there a correlation between your department's needs and, and those? In any well, way? Chairman, I think we've had this debate and discussion on several previous times. It was one of the elements brought into the previous debate, the one that uh, stalled, as it were. Um, every, all of the inquiries that I've made shows that that law, which is administered by the chief minister's department, does not include the uh, the basis of a uh, a register. Uh, what the register that is proposed would be is a register of properties, of properties which are rented as homes. And everything that I have been told, informed, that that there is no equivalent there. I don't know if my colleagues want to comment, but or whether any of my officers are available, but I am, do not believe that's the case. Because if I thought there was a duplication, I wouldn't be proceeding with this. There is no duplication. If I can add, in my opinion, the fact that we're doing this, I'm also proposing to do the bridged island plan for the three year period, makes it imperative that we have much greater clarity and certainty about the, um, about the base that we're working from of the stock of private, sorry, stock of rented dwellings in the island. We need that information. Yes, so. that, that's understood. Um, uh, I'm conscious of the time, Minister, and I'm going to move on to the Jersey National Park and Coastal National Park or Marine Conservation Areas. What's the progress with regard to the determination of the areas known as the Jersey National Park? Uh, and the coastal national park and the marine conservation area. Well, let's be straightforward. These are unfortunately these terms are often used as being the same thing. They are not. The coastal, the national, at the moment, the coastal national park is a planning zone, and it's also the name which is the planning zone in the planning law. Sorry, not in the planning law in the island plan, and it contains special planning policies. It's also the um, the 
uh, the area that covers the responsibilities that the Economic Development Minister has done for promoting recreation and tourism within the area. And at the moment, those boundaries are coterminous, they're the same. Uh, I have made it plain that in the island plan, the planning zone will not have the same boundaries. And that when we do the island plan, the bridging island plan, that work's been done, we're able to sort that out. Uh, in terms of the other one, which was the, uh, I think you called the fishing, uh, the marine, mar the marine. Marine conversation. Yeah. The conversation. Now, this is a concept which I believe is um, um, much supported by our economic development minister. I think there's a lot of work to do in that. That I did it on Radio 4 the other day, they were talking about these effects of these schemes. 40% of maritime waters in the UK are within such zones. But there's no question that those zones have to live side by side and happily with a sustainable fishing industry. And therefore trying to deal with that without taking on board and working with your fishing industry uh, to, to, to define that in great deal does a huge amount of work. And that's the direction of travel that I propose and will stick to. And I, and I, I, would, I would just flag up anybody dealing with anything to do with fishing regulation at the current time with Brexit, the whole business with Covid, the French, it, 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 you know, we have to take that industry with us and I'm determined that's really the case. So there, there is a strong role for concert areas uh, defined where the fishermen agree that fishing effort will be uh, managed or, or, or not take place and, and there's plenty of experiences elsewhere. But that's not just a matter of drawing a lump around the sea and saying here's the maritime protection zone, far from it. Uh, that, there's a big project there, Chairman, so we could probably have a whole session on that. What about uh, structures in the sea for renewable energy? Have you involved the Minister for Infrastructure in that? Does that come under his remit? Well, I think I'm going to maybe I'll have to ask Steve or Kevin because the issue of how far we're able to go in the infrastructure projects in the island plan is difficult. Can I ask Steve or Kevin? Uh, I'm happy to deal with that, uh, Minister. Yep. Um, yeah, as part of the uh, the island plan review, as the minister said, we will uh, look to undertake a range of um, uh, policy review. And one of those is the review of the planning policies that we have that apply to the marine environment. Uh, the current island plan just has uh, just has one sort of catch all um, uh, policy that applies to the whole of the marine environment at the moment. Um, as part of this island plan review, we are looking to uh, develop that um, further so that we have a, a richer policy regime for activities in the marine environment and that will include um, hopefully things such as uh, renewable energy, um, uh, issues such as um, uh, conservation of biodiversity and matters such as um, uh, the shoreline management um, issues that the island faces. So we're looking to develop, a, a, as I say, a richer policy regime as part of the island plan review. Um, and we've been talking to uh, key stakeholders um, within government as part of that process. Uh, obviously, that will be involving um, consultation with wider stakeholders as the plan progresses through its, uh, its various stages. Thank you. Minister, soil health strategy. Can you give an update on the monitoring programme, which I believe was being undertaken? Uh, Mr. Peggy or and the Deputy Greeder, I think, please. I'm, I'm very happy to, to give an update on that. Thanks. Um, the, this pertains to work that we've engaged uh, with colleagues at Cranfield University, uh, Soil Science Laboratories over there. Um, we've essentially got three areas of work uh, ongoing at the moment, two of which uh, are related to the, the, the wider strategic um, soil quality uh, and enhancement issues for the island. Um, they are uh, linked to academic processes and potential PhDs. Um, uh, up until the COVID uh, crisis came into place, um, we were having quite good discussions about what would be involved in that and the likely costs. Since COVID came into place, um, both we, as you've heard earlier on, and um, and Cranfield University staff have, have uh, to, to focus on various different areas, and so things things have slowed up a bit in that respect. That doesn't mean that we're not looking at it though. The the one area that we are making quite urgent progress on is um, uh, to do with a specific uh, product, which uh, is a Vellum Prime, which is a, a trade name for a. a, a, a uh, 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 
nematicide for potatoes. Um, uh, and the problem being at the minute that it's, it's a new product and it's deemed to be potentially too leachable for use in Jersey soil. So we're working with Cranfield um, and doing a, a lot of research across here ourselves to determine whether that is the case and whether long term exposure to this nematicide is going to be something that's going to either benefit or disbenefit the potato industry. Um, so that's the, the focus of work that our um, guys in the scientific labs are, are on at the moment. Um, uh, the, the wider strategic stuff we will get back to once um, COVID settles down a bit more, I think, is probably the, the summary position there. Thank you. The um, preservation of trees, uh, Minister, we previously discussed the practice of some developers felling all trees on a site they've acquired prior to, to submitting a planning application for the development. Can you give an update on proposals to bring an amendment to the law to prevent this? Uh, I wish I could. Um, well, I have signed a ministerial order, uh, sorry, a ministerial de decision some months ago uh, that this be added to the list of changes to the planning and building law that we uh, have uh, on the in the pipeline. It's a matter of serious uh, regret, and my office, the officers know this, that that list has been outstanding now, as far as I'm concerned, for almost two years. And I am just so frustrated that I cannot see, you know, I wish I could be more positive about it, but our lack of law resources um, is just so restricting us at the moment. Um, uh, and so um, Deputy Gila and I are passionate this has to be done. And I think, you know, not a week goes past without, uh, without me getting complaints that it's quite clear now that when you've got issues of wildlife on site, the, the practice of many developers, not all, there are some exceptions, but many developers just take the view, clear the site, destroy the vegetation, destroy any species on it, and then uh, knock the trees down, and then they won't have any risk of having any wildlife assessments, they won't have any conditions about preserving wildlife and so on. That's something that I'm in determined to stop. Thank you. The Food Safety Law Minister, can you update the panel of the progress on the draft food safety law and will it be revised in the light of the COVID-19 outbreak? Uh, can I just uh, interrupt you, sorry, uh, it's suddenly just gone off uh, from live, uh, so we've suddenly gone back onto pre-live. Okay. I've just been having a look, it seems that there's been a fault uh, with the server. How much did we miss? How much, when did uh, it happen? About 20 seconds ago. Okay. Should we, what should we do? Uh, I'll, try, I'll see if I can sort this out and then uh, I'll let you know when we can go back onto live. Right, so we'll talk amongst ourselves for a moment. We've we just about completed the uh, programme. We were on the last uh, yeah. item or two. Um, that was... Oh, back onto live. Oh, thank you, Theo. Well, uh, back to Food Safety Law Minister. Just can you update the panel of the progress on the draft food safety law and will it be revised in the light of the COVID outbreak? I'm going to defer to Mr. Peggy again that we've uh, we've got a uh, a, a person who the former director of uh, environmental health working on this project, and uh, I think I can think of nobody better to do so and uh, motoring away. So, Mr. Peggy, please. I can think of nobody better to do so either. Particularly Barry, mind he sent an email with a, a bit of a, a uh, an update position, and so if you don't mind, if I could sort of go through it um, just to try and give a, a, a brief taste. So uh, points to note are that the change to the title of the law to, to reflect that it covers more than just food hygiene and food safety and to ensure it continues to do so. Um, so there's an element of future proofing involved in there. Um, the law is going to include OCR, so overarching control regulation provisions applicable to food. And this is to ensure those uh, regulations needed in food in terms of OCR preserved, whatever happens to the separate OCR provisions uh, which we brought in earlier. Um, and now this is in uh, essentially preemptive defence in light of SCOPATH requirements, which is uh, a potential uh, hurdle for Brexit uh, related uh, progress. Um, the, the debate of the law, uh, when and if enacted, will allow the emergency orders to be brought in at the end of 2019 um, to be fully debated. Sorry, that they were brought in at the end of 2019 to be fully debated, um, as promised by the Minister, and to fall away in due course if the law progresses. Um, Stuart advises that. We're happy at the moment and ready to present to scrutiny at any stage and indeed any comment by scrutiny would be extremely helpful as would an indication of how long they would envisage that they will require for that process. Um, 
Stuart's advising. Again, extensive uh, public consultation has been carried out um, with an increased likelihood of day one no deal uh, Brexit on January the 1st, or, or what's not, not now being called day one no deal, but the Australian proposition. Um, the sooner this legislation is debated, the better prepared the island will be to protect Islanders and its food businesses. Um, so we should be ready to lodge by September, um, but it may come forward as COVID crushes ease. Um, I think that's about all we need to say on that at the moment, or I, all I can say on that matter at the moment, if that's OK. Thank you very much indeed. And, and one final question, um, Minister, with regard on the fishing side of things, which uh, uh, you may be able to answer this. A bit of disquiet over the scientific research uh, with regard to bass fishing, and I wondered uh, if you could give us an update uh, on that, where we might be. Well, I mean, can I ask? Is um, I haven't, I'm not aware of that criticism. Is this criticism for uh, any particular sector? So I'm aware of it. Let, perhaps I can help there. Um, I, I was in discussions with uh, our head of marine resources uh, just at the back end of last week, who advised me that he'd been in a very lengthy conversation with Defra, um, apropos a uh, a query from the UK Bass Angling Society. Um, having been prompted by, a, I think, a local uh, interested party across here, questioning methodology over the work that we're doing in relating in related to bass. So we explained, uh, or we discussed commercial regulations, netting trials, the bag limits that we've put in place, um, and actually DEFRA have uh, weren't aware of that work that we've we've been undertaking. Um, they advised really that Jersey is much more conservative and ahead of the curve, as it were, than the UK and EU controls and, and um, congratulated us um, on the actions that we and the Minister is taking. And so we agreed that we would share any data that comes off the back of that. We know that DEFRA are now going to go back to the UK Bass Anglers Society, um, saying that the, the study work that we're doing is proportionate um, and they've got no challenges, no problems with what we're up to. And that will then be relayed back to the uh, the, the person who had concerns, I think, from a more local perspective around well, here. So you. I think I'm grateful for that, uh, Chairman. I must admit this, this this obviously complaint has just cropped up, but uh, obviously for a deeper discussion, I'd want to bring in uh, that uh, Greg Morell, our Marine officer on this, because these things are very, very complex. What we're trying to do is to uh, have sustainable fishery. Um, there are lots of issues in different species, but obviously what we try to do is 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 Get that right and judgments are and that it's the basis of science that what we try and do if we had more money on on investment in marine research and uh, we had more resources then we'd be able to do more but i think we do the team does pretty good uh, just uh, a, as a final uh, question minister in terms of our fishing industry clearly i, I appreciate you've uh, uh, supporting the best of your ability uh, how are we advancing with our discussions uh, with regard to Brexit and the machinations that may be going on in that direction? Well, a number of things quickly summing up. Um, as you know, I got the sign off last Friday, I'm pleased to say, of the fishing support uh, scheme, um, which took a little while, but nonetheless, we've now got an arrangement to support our fishermen and keep that fleet in the water uh, for an interim period. That's really good news. I'm hoping that will reduce the tensions that exist. But there are very significant tensions, I'm afraid. Um, work is going on to try and uh, re uh, to come up with some uh, measures, conservation measures, particularly regard to bream fishery or between hatcheries for bream. And uh, the officers are advancing that work in order to bring that forward. But in the meantime, uh, Senator Gorst, uh, 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 I've asked Senator Gorst uh, and his team, external relations, to try and facilitate uh, um, meetings virtual meetings, whatever, with the French, because I think I do not want the tensions of this horrendous um, uh, face face off that's happened between the UK and, and the EU on fishing to effectively um, met, uh, completely make life impossible. So we, we can't get caught in the middle of that. And so I've asked Senator Gorse and, and, and Deputy Gida as well. Um, I'm hopeful that we can do that, but in the meantime, Tensions are there, but I think the scheme we've introduced will help, will ease ease those ease that tensions. So, Chairman, may I may I ask a question, please? Do. Um, sorry to sorry to tell you, how are we how are we doing with the Bay of Granville? Oh, 
Um, the Bay of, for, for two years, as you know, um, the two years at least, certainly since I've been the minister, and I think before that, um, the Bay of Granville, um, our fishermen have been seeking to get changes or uh, to the Bay of Granville agreement in negotiation with the French using the fisherman to fisherman um, methods of negotiation yeah. um, that, that, that the agreement provides for. So there's no political um, negotiation. There's no there's no political processes in the Bay of Granville, and so it's a, it's a matter of record that those relations that, that has not has been successful. Uh, but nonetheless, um, officers are seeking to maintain that dialogue. We're maintaining it. And uh, and I'm very hopeful that once we get this Brexit situation out of the way and we know what is going to happen, we can um, come to a point where that agreement, albeit with the changes we want to see made, are made. But we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to get that way, that point now. Um, we're going to have to wait for the... So the UK Brexit situation to be resolved. All right, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, Minister, we've taken up uh, your full time. Um, we've squeezed our questions in. I'm sorry I've had to rush through to a degree. Uh, thank you to you and your officers for uh, presenting this morning. And we look forward to speaking again in due course. Thank, thank you very, you very much. much, Chairman. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.